You're listening to The Taylor Marshall Show, a special podcast series on the book of Revelation called The Catholic Apocalypse. Today we look at Revelation chapter 20, the thousand-year reign of Christ, and we look at this controversial teaching over whether the Catholic Church is premillennial, amillennial, or postmillennial. If you don't know what that means, don't worry, we're going to go through it all in today's episode. Howdy, and thank you for tuning into the Taylor Marshall Show. This is the podcast for everyone who wants to create daily habits and learn enough theology to take their faith to the next level. Did you know that there have been Catholic saints, canonized saints, who have come up with the wrong interpretation on the millennium in Revelation 20? We're going to learn why that is and what the Catholic Church teaches today on this topic. Well, when I was a Protestant, there was a lot of debate about the end times and a lot of debate over the millennium, the 1,000-year reign of Christ. And fortunately, later when I became a Catholic, there's very clear teaching in the catechism. The, in fact, the Holy See put out a, a uh, decree on this even uh, as recent ago as the 1940s. Um, but the reason it's so controversial in history and amongst Protestants and even amongst some Catholics, especially some doomsday Catholics who follow different visionaries and whatnot, is because in the early church, there was a lot of confusion on this point. We know the magisterium of the Catholic Church is infallible. However, there have been times in history where certain saints believed the wrong thing. There have been saints who followed anti-popes. There have been saints who have, at points in their life, even unto the end, uh, confessed things or taught things that were later in the magisterium uh, confirmed to be incorrect. For example, classic case is St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, if you're a member of the new St. Thomas Institute, you know that we did a whole video on this. Did Thomas Aquinas uh, deny the Immaculate Conception? And it seems early in his life he did not. He affirmed it properly. In the middle part of his life, he did deny it, which would be incorrect. It technically is a material heresy. And then later in his life, he may have reaffirmed it. Um, but it's okay because the Immaculate Conception was not yet uh, declared a dogma of the church until the 1800s. So he doesn't fall under the decree of, of heresy, but that's just an example. And when it comes to this millennium, we find the exact same situation with some of our most beloved saints. Since we're giving you the Catholic apocalypse, I'm going to give you the list of many of the saints who are on each side of this issue. But before I do, I want to read the the first part of Revelation 20, just so you know what the text says, what's going on in the apocalypse, and then we'll look at the, the rest of the theological controversy. So Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. And excuse me, you may notice that I sound a little bit nasally. I've been fighting a cold the last two days, and I've been delaying this recording. I said, oh, what the heck? I'll go ahead and record it with a nasally uh, cold voice. So if, if I sound a little bit different, that's why. Okay, Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be let out for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom judgment was committed. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony to Jesus and for the word of God, and who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and they shall reign with him one thousand years. End quote. So what happens here? Well, we see an angel come from heaven. He has a, a big key. And he takes hold of the devil, Lucifer, and he puts him in the pit and he shuts him and he seals it for a 1,000 year period. So a 1,000 years is a millennium. And when this happens, 
the saints and the martyrs reign with Christ for this thousand years. And at the end of the thousand years, Satan is going to be released for a little while, it says. So in the history of the Catholic Church, there's been some debate on when this thousand year period will happen and what will be the nature of this thousand year period or the millennium. And I'll just use the word millennium for the rest of the podcast. That means the thousand year reign of Jesus in which Satan is bound with a chain in a pit as described in Revelation 20. Well, there are three popular views of Revelation 20. The first is called pre-millennialism, pre-millennialism. The second is called ah millennialism. That's just the letter A in front of the word millennial. And then the third one is post-millennialism. So pre, ah, and post-millennialism. Got it? Pre, ah, post. So pre-millennialism believes that before, that is pre, pre is a prefix meaning before, that before the end of the world, Christ will come to earth physically. He will set up a physical throne probably Jerusalem, and he will reign on earth for 1,000 years, and then the end of the world will come. That is called pre-millennialism. In other words, the millennium happens before the end of the world. The second view is called amillennialism, with the A, and A in the front of a word in Greek means not. Like if you're an atheist, that means you're not a theist. So this is an amillennialist. This view, which is the official Catholic view, states that the millennium, the 1,000-year reign, is just an allegory. It's just a symbol for a really long period of time. Okay? So this viewpoint says, look, this 1,000-year thing, just like all the other numbers, in the book of Revelation is symbolic. We should not think that these that this thousand year period, the millennium, literally is going to be a thousand year period, either in the past or in the future. Okay. Then the third view is called postmillennialism. And postmillennialism believes that there will be a thousand year reign or a very long reign of Jesus Christ on earth, but Christ won't physically be on earth. In other words, Christianity will be ruling the world. All the nations of the earth will be officially Christian nations, and they'll have Christian laws. And this will go on for a long time, maybe a thousand years, and then the end of the world will come. So the end of the world will come after a millennium on earth. That's called post-millennialism. Post-millennialism. Okay, so there are the three views. Now, in the history of Christianity in the Catholic Church, the two views that have been set forth the most are the first two options, premillennialism and amillennialism. Notably, in the early church, many, many, many Catholics, many Christians were premillennial. That is, they believed sometime in the future Jesus would physically come down from heaven, and it wouldn't be the end of the world. And he would come to Jerusalem, and he would set up his king, his kingdom, his court, there in Jerusalem. And for literally 1,000 years on earth, he and all the saints and the apostles would be ruling all the peoples of the earth for 1,000 years. And then at the end of that 1,000 years would come the judgment doomsday, and that would be the end of time, the end of the world. Then eternity would begin. Now, some of the saints who believe this view, which is deemed incorrect, technically heretical today by the Catholic Church, some of the saints who actually believe this are St. Justin Martyr, that great apologist of the second century. He was a pre-mill Christian. Also, St. Irenaeus of Lyon, another great apologist, also held to the pre-millennial error. Um, One of the church fathers, lesser known, Papias, also held to this view. And 
Tertullian. Now, Tertullian's not a saint because Tertullian belonged to a quasi-heretical group called the Montanists. But all the Montanists following the heretic Montanists were also pre-millennial. And Tertullian, since he followed them as well, he also was pre-millennial. So these great Christian men who composed theology that we still study today, that seminarians still study, that Catholic theologians still study and respect, St. Justin Martyr, St. Irenaeus, Tertullian, these men, and presumably their disciples, their students, believed in pre-millennial eschatology. They believed that Christ was going to come to earth, set up a physical, visible kingdom on earth that would last literally 1,000 years, and then Satan would be released and there'd be a big tribulation, apparently with Jesus still on earth, and then he would be slayed, and then eternity would begin. Okay, so this was, you know, a prominent belief early on in Christianity. And why is that? Well, men like Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Tertullian are reading the book of Revelation, and they're, for some reason, reading Revelation 20 as a literal time period. And the confusing thing about Revelation 20, you may have picked it up as I was reading it, is it speaks of the first and second resurrection and the first and second death. So the first resurrection happens at the beginning of the thousand year reign, and then the second resurrection happens at the end of the thousand year reign. And so how do we understand this? Well, we are blessed as Catholics to have a number of of other saints who came along and corrected the error that St. Justin Martyr and St. Irenaeus made. And those who came along and basically put forth the teaching that we call amillennial, that is, the millennium is not actually um, a future or a literal 1,000-year span of 365 days, would include the following saints. So for our Amillennialist, we have, of course, St. Augustine of Hippo, his mentor, St. Ambrose of Milan, also St. Hippolytus of Rome, St. Cyprian of Carthage, St. Athanasius, that great defender of the Holy Trinity, St. Cyril of Jerusalem, also St. Basil the Great, St. Gregory Nazianzus, St. Gregory Nyssa, also St. Gregory the Great. So, All the big players in church history, especially after the Council of Nicaea, are seeing the millennium in Revelation 20 as a symbol, as an allegory of a long time. And the way that they understand the first and second resurrection and the first and second death is they see that whenever a Christian in the early church, or even today, dies, they go to the particular judgment. And if they are saved, if they're in a state of grace and there's no need for purgatory or they escape purgatory um, through their just time or through the suffrages of those on earth, they experience the, quote, first resurrection, and that is the elevation of their soul to the beatific vision. The second resurrection is when their body is physically raised from the dead at the end of time. So let's take a look at someone like St. Peter. St. Peter dies around the year 68 AD. He dies. He goes to heaven. He's a martyr. That's the first resurrection. All right, so his soul goes to heaven. And then the second resurrection discussed here in Revelation 20 would be when his body, not his soul, but this time his body at the end of time is resurrected and lifted up and reunited with his soul. So the thousand-year period is the span between the early church, the death of St. Peter, and then the end of time. So a thousand years just means a really, 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 really long time. It's not literally a thousand years. Same goes for someone like St. Augustine. He dies in the year 430. His soul goes to heaven. That's the first resurrection. His soul is resurrected. And then at the end of time, his body will be resurrected That's the second resurrection. So you can see here that the thousand years is just a symbol um, 
designating the time between the death of someone, their first resurrection, their soul, and then the end of time, the second resurrection of their body. So this is how uh, St. Hippolytus, St. Cyprian, St. Augustine, St. Ambrose, St. Athanasius, the Cappadocian Fathers, the Eastern Fathers are reading Revelation 20, and that is the a-millennial position, the a-millennial position. There is no literal millennium. The millennium is just Christ reigning in heaven with the saints. He's not literally reigning on earth. He's reigning in heaven perfectly. So the kingdom is a heavenly kingdom, not a visible earthly kingdom. Now, people who don't like the amillennial position or postmillennialist will say, well, but look at what it says there in Revelation chapter 20, verse 3. It says that the devil is chained and he's put into a pit so he can't deceive the nations anymore. But if we're living in the symbolic millennium right now, why is it that Satan is deceiving the nations? I mean, nations have all sorts of you know, laws favoring abortion or laws that don't uphold the holy sacrament of matrimony. Clearly, Satan is deceiving the nations. Look at a nation like uh, Egypt or Syria or Saudi Arabia. These nations are not under the reign of Christ, and the devil seems to be pretty darn active in these nations. So if the millennium is symbolically right now and Christ is reigning, how come the devil is deceiving? That's the objection. Well, the amillennialist answer, and the answer, by the way, from the Catholic Church is, the devil is in fact chained, but the chain is a rather long chain. In other words, the devil is restricted in what he can do on earth because of Christ and the Catholic Church, which is his visible kingdom on earth. The Catholic Church is the visible kingdom. And so the church, through her preaching, through her positive influence, is in fact restricting the evil influence of the the devil on earth. If the, if the church wasn't here, if the gospel wasn't here, the devil would have free reign all over the world just as he did back in the old days, B.C., before Christ, where he had human sacrifice and all kinds of evil things happening. So right now there is a struggle. Satan is bound because of the influence of the Catholic Church on the world. And so in verse 4, it says, Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were um, those who were given judgment, This would refer to, of course, the saints on high, but also to the popes and the bishops who are restraining evil in the world. Notably, it says that at the end of this period, the devil will be released and he'll get to have lots and lots of influence once again, just as he did before Christ came. And this is the tribulation. This is the future Antichrist. You know, we've done a lot of studies in this uh, series on preterism. Preterism is the belief that most of Revelation, that is Revelations chapter 1 through 19, those chapters, are primarily in the past. They surround the events of the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple for her infidelity, the end of the Old Covenant, from AD 33 to AD 70. But when we get to Revelation 20, we're looking at the future. What happens, not just a thousand years, but many, many, many centuries into the future. And so when Satan is released again, we'll see that the Catholic Church, the Pope, the bishops, lose their power to restrain evil. Satan gets free reign the Catholic Church becomes weak. And this is why some people in our time, and in fact, any time in the history when the Catholic Church has setbacks, they say, oh my goodness, we're living in the end times. Maybe Satan has been unchained. Maybe the smoke of Satan is wafting through the world, even maybe through the church. And so we're living in the end times. The thousand-year sway of Christ over the nations of the world has come to an end. Maybe so. I don't know. I'm not a prophet. Uh, I'm just a biblical scholar. I'm just going through the book of Revelation. So we can look into the future and see 
a time when the the devil is cut loose. And we see this described in chapter 20, verse 7. I'll read that part now. Chapter 20, verse 7, quote, And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are at the four corners of the earth, that is, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, But fire came down from heaven and consumed them, and the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever. End quote. Okay, so when this symbolic thousand-year reign is over, Satan goes and he deceives the world. And it mentions here Gog and Magog. Gog and Magog. Gog is a ruler in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 38, and Magog is his army. Now, some people say that this is Russia. And why do they say it's Russia? Well, if you look in Ezekiel 38, you'll see that Gog is of the land of Magog. So Magog is the geographic location. And he's the ruler of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. And some people speculate that the term Rosh there refers to Russia. Russia. I think it's a stretch. I don't think it's correct. Uh, but some people, especially Protestants, people who are really into the rapture, which we Catholics don't believe, um, and premillennial eschatology, think this is a reference to Rosha. Notably, St. Gregory the Great, who was a, a pope and who was an amillennialist, he says that you know the location of Gog and Magog to the north, that's another reason, because Russia is due north of the Holy Land. And so since Gog and Magog are described as to the north, it could refer to, to Russia. But he says that the north um, refers to that which is cold and the south to that which is warm. And so he says that the north symbolizes the devil because the cold restricts us and that the south refers to Christ and his kingdom, the warmth um, of the sun. St. Gregory the Great says, because the former loosens with heat and the latter constrains with cold. So Gog and Magog are seen as cold and in the north and the kingdom of Christ is seen as warm and in the south. And by the way, if you ever attend the the old mass, the traditional, the Latin mass, you know, prior to 1965 if you, or the 1962 missal, if you go to the old mass, you'll see that the gospel lesson is read facing the north side, the north side of the altar. And the reason for this is the gospel was to go to the pagan nations. The gospel was to go to Gog and Magog, and therefore the gospel was read on the north side of the altar. It's referring to, of course, Ezekiel 38, 39, but also has reference here to Revelation chapter 20, a little bit of liturgical symbolism for you. Now, there's this great battle. So Gog and Magog, and and by the way, Gog and Magog, could it be Russia? Well, it is north of the Holy Land. And there is this reference to Rosh. I don't really think in the Hebrew that it it substantiates that. But of course, there is also Our Lady of Fatima, which has special apocalyptic language directed at Russia. So who knows? Does Russia have a part to play in the end times? I don't know. I don't feel comfortable making those conclusions based just on this reference to Gog and Magog. Maybe it does. We'll have to wait and see. And of course... At the time I'm recording this, there are some interesting things going on in Russia, but I'm not one to take the newspaper and read it alongside the book of Revelation, and I don't think you should as well. So Satan is released. He inspires Gog and Magog to bring all the nations from the four corners of the earth in a great rebellion against Christ. So the Catholic Church sees this as, at the end of time, Satan will be released the nations will have what's called the great apostasy. 
We'll see all the nations, even those that were previously Catholic and Christian, throw off their Christian identity. It's called the Great Apostasy. And they will follow a leader who's called here symbolically Gog, G-O-G, and they will make war against Christ and the church. But as it says in Ezekiel 38 and 39, and as we see here in Revelation 20, uh, they will be surrounded, the saints will be surrounded, but fire will come down from heaven and consume all these nations that are resisting Christ in the church. And then the devil will be thrown into the lake of fire. And it mentions that the beast and the false prophet are there. That's the sea beast and the land beast, the political and the religious deceivers that we saw already in Revelation 13 that symbolized, that symbolized the Roman Empire and apostate Israel, the apostate high priesthood, the apostate Jerusalem in the, in the temple, which has no longer become a sacramental place of God's presence, but is now in Christ and in the Eucharist. So we see that they've already been in the lake of fire, for a thousand years, that is for the entire Christian period, the period of AD. Now the devil is finally damned. It's the end. The devil has been put away. And then we have the second coming. We have the judgment. And this begins in verse 11 of 20. And I'll read this beginning at 11. Quote, then I saw a great white throne in him who sat upon it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Also another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, by what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead in it, death and Hades gave up the dead in them, and all were judged by what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire, that is, the second death the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. End quote. End of Revelation chapter 20. So we've read all of 20 right there. Okay, so Christ comes. He appears. He's on a great white throne. And we've seen this whiteness in relation to Christ throughout the book of Revelation. So in chapter 1, we saw that Christ had white hair. In chapter 3, we saw that Christ was wearing a white vestment. In chapter 14, we saw that he was on a white cloud. And then just recently in chapter 19, in the last episode, we saw that Christ was riding on a white horse. So now in chapter 20, he's sitting on a white throne. So the color for Christ is white. And we see that the saints are clothed in white robes, also in chapter 19, but we saw that before in, in chapter 4, we saw it in chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 15, that those who belong to Jesus Christ also wear white robes. So white is the color of Christ. Incidentally, liturgically in the Catholic Church, any feast day of Jesus Christ has to have white vestments. They can have gold on them, but they're chiefly white vestments. So Christmas, white. Easter, white. The liturgical color of Christ is white, and it's because of the book of Revelation. Then we see all the dead, great and small, brought before Christ. The sea gives up the dead. Hell, Hades gives up the dead. The earth gives up the dead. All the dead are assembled and stand before Jesus Christ, and the books are opened, and they're judged by what they have done. Sorry, Protestants, it doesn't say they will be judged by faith alone, as Martin Luther wrongly taught the world in the 1500s. Just as the Catholic Church has always taught, we are justified by faith and works. Our works are dead. Our works are worth nothing in the eyes of God. This is the Catholic teaching. However, by faith and by being united to Jesus Christ, the grace and power of Jesus Christ makes our works meaningful, makes our works pleasing to God. So if we have faith in Christ, if we hope in Christ, if we love Christ, that which we do in the name of Jesus Christ, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, preaching the gospel, all the good that we do with faith in Christ 
is accounted as righteous to us. It's Christ's righteousness repackaged into our hearts. And it's salvific. So we don't believe in works alone as Catholics. We believe in faith and works. And here we see that the dead are judged by what they have done. So if you are a non-believer, if you've rejected Jesus Christ, you do not have any good works that have Jesus wrapped up in those works. Christ did not make your works acceptable to God, and therefore you cannot be saved. But if you did have faith and you lived out your faith, your works are a testimony to Christ's work in you, you will be saved. So those who are not found in the book of life are cast into the lake of fire, which here in Revelation 20, it's called the second death. The first death is when you die physically. The second death is when you're cast into the lake of fire. Just as we saw earlier, there's a first resurrection and a second resurrection. Here we have a first death and a second death. And it says in verse 15, If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So those who are saved are written in the Lamb's book of life. Those who are not are not written in the book of life. What is the book of life? The book of life is the mind of God. It's the memory of God that keeps record of what we have done in this life. So there's Revelation 20. It's a very short chapter. It's only 15 verses. Just a bit of review. The first part, we looked at the millennium. We looked at the three theories on the millennium, pre-mill, ah-mill, post-mill. We saw that many early Christians like St. Justin, St. Irenaeus, Tertullian, believed in the pre-mill doctrine, which states that Christ literally would set up a physical and visible kingdom on earth for a thousand years. For that thousand years, everyone's going to live in peace and have righteous laws on earth. At the end of that thousand years, Satan would be released and there'd be a big battle between Jesus and Satan and Gog and Magog. And then the judgment day would come, the final resurrection. That position is rejected by great saints like St. Augustine, St. Ambrose, St. Gregory Nazianza, St. Gregory Nyssa, Basil the Great, St. Athanasius. They instead teach that the millennium is a symbol. It's an allegory of the time between Christ, death, and resurrection all the way until the end of the world. And Satan being bound refers to the positive influence of Christ's kingdom on earth, known as the Catholic Church, having an influence upon the nations. We didn't talk too much about post-millennial, but post-millennialism is condemned in the catechism of the Catholic Church. It holds that there will be a time period in which all the nations on earth become explicitly Christian for a certain time period. So the United States of America would be a Catholic nation, Russia would be a Catholic nation. Saudi Arabia would be a Catholic nation. China would be a Catholic nation. Australia would be a Catholic nation. Brazil would be a Catholic nation. The entire earth is Catholic. Presumably you'd have you know laws that support Catholic marriage. Uh, there'd be no abortion. There would be no other religions because everybody had converted to Catholicism. And that this would last for a long time, maybe a thousand years. And then Satan would be loosed on earth and there would be a great apostasy there. Uh, This position, honestly, I don't think there's any Catholic support of this in the early church, in the medieval church. There is a a mystic named Joachim of Fior, and he did hold to a epic of the Holy Spirit in which on earth there would be this reign of Christ. Um, He had a lot of weird... Uh, ideas about what this would look like. He actually said that there wouldn't be any sacraments or any priesthood because everyone would commune directly with God during this time period. Um, There was a a very strange episode at the Reformation where a bunch of Protestant Anabaptists gathered together in a place called Munster and had this post-millennial, very strange um, theocracy, which turned into a nightmare and everyone ended up being killed. Um, so there are some examples of the post-meal doctrine. There are some Catholic visionaries, some 
Catholic mystics, even around today, who teach that there will be a time period in which the entire earth um, becomes Catholic and all the nations become Catholic. Uh, I guess it could happen, but it's not a majority teaching in the Catholic Church. Um, We believe that Christ's kingdom is not of this world, as he said to Pontius Pilate. We believe that the Catholic Church is his visible kingdom here on earth, but there doesn't ever seem to be an indication that the Catholic Church will be 100% successful and every single person on earth will be Catholic and will be living in conformity with the Catholic Church before the end of time. We are to always strive for that. I personally believe, if you listen to my other podcasts, we should all be striving to convert every single person on earth. But to have an assurance that that will happen and will last for a thousand years before the end of time is a bit of a stretch, and it doesn't seem to be something found to be something found in Catholic theology. So there's Revelation chapter 20. In the next two chapters, Revelation chapter 21 and 22, we'll come to the end of the book of Revelation. What, what do we have up next? Well, we have the New Jerusalem, we have the River of Life, and then we have the final epilogue and the benediction to the book of Revelation. Closing practical application for you at home, wherever you are, driving in the car. Here it is. We are sometimes afraid of the devil, and we're afraid of evil. And as Catholics, we believe that right now, the devil is bound. An angel has put a spiritual chain around him. And that means that the devil can only do what God allows him to do. It also means that Christ has given you, as a baptized Christian, as a confirmed Catholic who's received confirmation, who receives the Eucharist, authority over the demons. This means that you can say prayers like the following, and I encourage you to do this. I know wonderful Catholic priests and exorcists who encourage lay people to say this prayer, and it goes like this. Lord, if there are any unclean spirits here, in the name of Jesus Christ and through his precious blood, we bind them and send them to the foot of the cross to be judged. Amen. Now, this isn't a formal exorcism, but it is a deliverance prayer. We, as Christians, do have authority Because we are in Christ. Christ's authority extends to us. Now, we don't have the sacerdotal authority to do formal exorcisms. Don't misunderstand me there. But devils are afraid of you. We read that even, you know, famous female mystics like St. Catherine of Siena, you know, they weren't priests, but they saw that the devil was afraid of them. And if we are living in Christ and we are striving to live a holy life, and yes, we all make mistakes, and even if you do make a big mistake and commit a mortal sin, go to confession. When you go to confession, you are restored again in Christ. The devil fears you, and the devil wants to attack you, and he wants to bring all the hosts of the four corners of the world to make you afraid and to discourage you. But know that through the sign of the cross, which you can make in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and through prayers like these and through things like holy water, in attending Mass, and using sacramentals, the devil is afraid of you. He is more afraid of you than you are of him. That's how it should be. And we should have confidence in Christ to know that, you know, we are not as smart as the devil. The devil was, was you know, he, he was a seraph. He was the highest of angel. His mind is, a, is greater than the mind of Thomas Aquinas, the greatest of any human theologian. So you're never going to outsmart the devil. But you do have the graces in the influence with Jesus and with Mary and with Joseph and with the saints to overcome the devil. It says in the Bible, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So don't taunt the devil. Don't attract the devil. But no, if you're afraid, you can pray these prayers. If you notice someone, maybe in your family or at work, who seems to be tormented by dark spirits, Sometimes, you know, I notice this as well. The prayer you should use goes like this. God, the Father in heaven, if there are any unclean spirits here, or you could say, if there are any unclean spirits tormenting or influencing, insert a name, John. If there are any unclean spirits influencing John, 
In the name of Jesus Christ and through his precious blood, we bind those unclean spirits and send them to the foot of the cross to be judged by Jesus Christ. Amen. Remember, it's not you that has authority over the devils. It's Jesus who has authority. Let him do the judging. But you just ask God the Father to bind those unclean spirits through the blood of Jesus, send them to the foot of the cross, that they may be cast into hell, that they may be sent away. Those kind of prayers have true power, and we as Christians should be praying those kind of prayers. It's not a formal exorcism. It is a prayer. Jesus says, whatever you ask in my name, he will give you. We know that Jesus wants to overcome the devil. He can overcome the devil, and he wants to free people from the influence and power of the devil. So your meditation is to think about the devil as being bound already. And Satan, when you pray, it's like it's like um, you know a dog on a leash. You know when when we pray, it's like Christ or that angel pulling on that leash and choking the devil and pulling him back off of yourself, off of other people. So I don't want you to say be emboldened or taunt the devil. That's not what I'm saying. I don't want you to be like that at all. But realize that the devil is not more powerful than Jesus Christ. Sometimes when I speak to groups, I say, give me the opposite of what I'm about to say. So I'll say black, they'll say white. I'll say night, they'll say day. I'll say Satan, and they say God. And I say, "Eh, that is incorrect. God is eternal. He is infinite. Satan is a finite creature. Technically, the opposite of Satan is Saint Michael. God does not have an opposite. God is the creator. God is, you know, being himself. He is self-sustaining. He has no beginning. He has no end. Satan has a beginning. Satan is created. Satan, his whole existence still depends upon the creation of God. So Satan is not the opposite of God. And so God is infinitely more powerful than Satan. And Satan can only do what God allows him to do. And as Christians, we know that ultimately, as we read here in Revelation, Satan is going to lose. Jesus is going to win, win everything. So until next time, you can think of Christ riding on that white horse. We ride after him. We bring the gospel. We bring deliverance. We bring good news. We bring blessings to all the nations. We have an apocalyptic identity as Christians. And here in Revelation, it's talked about going out into into battle and proclaiming the good news and the trumpets. But elsewhere, it's, as we say in every podcast, it's being salt. It's being light. It's being a blessing to every single person that you meet throughout your day, throughout your week, throughout your year. So until next time, remember that our Lord Jesus Christ said that you are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty. was brought to you by the new St. Thomas Institute. Discover online Catholic classes and earn your certificate in Catholic theology at the new St. Thomas Institute. To register for online Catholic classes, please visit newsaintthomas.com. That's newsaintthomas.com.